Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk here about the complications of an MI. So uh, in previous videos, we talked about how to, how to diagnose uh, chest pain, uh, particularly uh, as it relates to acute coronary syndromes. We've talked about the inpatient and outpatient management of a patient who uh, is having an MI or who has had an MI recently. Uh, and now we're going to talk about some of the things that can go wrong, either while you're in the hospital or after. And we've kind of made uh, references to this. Um, and a lot of these things I go into in my other videos uh, because uh, some of these are arrhythmias and I have videos that are completely dedicated to that. So um, we're going to touch on the complications, but the nitty gritty details, which you will be responsible for knowing uh, for your exam, I do cover in other videos. So consider this video to be an overview of the basics that you need to know. And this does come up particularly on multiple choice questions. So on step two and step three, multiple choice questions, um, you'll be expected to know about these things. Uh, but as far as CCS, you're more likely to get a patient who is having a heart attack and you'll need to know how to work them up in the initial management. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you will get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, these are the complications of an MI. Um, so uh, I kind of put these in order here of when they happen. Um, so the first is the electrical or conductional disturbances. Um, we can just call these arrhythmias. And like I said, I have a lot of videos on arrhythmias, so I'm not gonna go into too many of the details here. Uh, we'll talk about contractile dysfunction, in other words, the heart's ability to pump. We'll talk about mechanical dysfunction, uh, things that can go wrong to the structure of the heart after an MI. We'll talk about acute pericarditis or Dressler syndrome, which tends to happen weeks after an MI. And then reinfarction, we're not going to talk about, um, and that's just because that's just a new MI. Now, this is kind of a timeline of when these happen. Notice the arrhythmias are most severe um, uh, or problematic very early on within the first uh anywhere from hours to a couple days. Uh, and then we kind of move into uh, issues with the heart's ability to pump, either cardiogenic shock or just congestive heart failure. Uh, stroke is one we're not going to talk about so much here. This is an adverse effect usually of uh, treatment, so PCI or uh, thrombolysis. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about uh, these mechanical issues, uh, papillary muscle rupture, VS rupture, um, and then free wall rupture, and then pericarditis, which is much more long-term. This is another way that you can uh, look at it. Okay, so arrhythmias are the most common complication of MI. Uh, almost all patients will have some sort of an arrhythmia, which may be subclinical or it may be uh, actually symptomatic. Uh, because we have these patients on, uh, on continuous EKG monitoring while they're in the hospital, it's common to pick up arrhythmias. So that's probably why we see a lot of them, even though the majority of them are likely asymptomatic. Um, there are a number that can happen. Pretty much any arrhythmia can be a consequence of an MI, but the big ones uh, to remember are V-fib uh, because it can result in sudden death. A lot of times patients will have V-fib uh, before they even get to the hospital, consequently they die. Um, another one is uh, the conduction blocks, uh, which I have in its own specific video uh, on the Brady arrhythmias. This is the conduction system of the heart. Now notice that we have the SA node here and the AV node here. Very responsible, uh, very, very, very important and responsible uh, for uh, a proper um, rhythm, a proper sinus rhythm, right? Now notice where they're located. What vessel supplies this part of the heart? The right coronary artery. And so um, if we're dealing with a patient who's had a posterior MI, which is due to blockage of the right coronary artery, uh, these patients are gonna be at particular risk for some of these uh, arrhythmias, specifically those AV blocks. All right, so uh, bradycardia, uh, like I said, I've got a whole video for that, uh, but it is worth knowing uh, these bradycardias. 
Um, I want to point out here that if you have a patient who is hospitalized for an MI and they start to develop uh, a you know lightheadedness, loss of conscience, con- loss of consciousness, um, or uh, you start noticing just these general changes, you have to keep this in mind. Now, generally, we don't treat patients uh, who have bradycardia unless they're symptomatic. Um, so, uh, for a symptomatic bradycardia, the initial treatment is atropine. If that's not sufficient, it's pacing, okay? This is a uh, bradycardia. This is a sinus bradycardia. So, everything is normal on this EKG other than it's a slow rhythm. Um, so, remember how to uh, figure out a rhythm based on the number of big blocks. So, it's 360 divided by the number of big blocks between the QRS complexes. Um, so, let's just take a look here. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, about six and a half big blocks. So if you've got more than six big blocks, then it's bradycardia because 360 divided by six is 60. Now here you see it's much more severe. Um, so we'll start kind of, um, I, know, I, I like to start where a QRS complex is by a bold line. So right here, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven and a half. So, you know, we're probably talking low 50s, high 40s here. All right, so here's another one. Uh, this is actually a junctional bradycardia, and we know this because there are abnormalities to the P waves. All right, V-fib, uh, there's a whole protocol for that. I talked about that in my Code Blue talk. Go and watch that if you want. That's actually been fairly recently updated. Um, the treatment here is defibrillation. And this is what it looks like, obviously just very disordered electrical pattern. All right, so uh, some of the conduction abnormalities, um, particularly here we're talking about AV blocks. Now, AV blocks can happen in anyone, uh, but they uh, are very common in patients who have had a posterior MI just because that area affects the SA and AV uh, nodal areas. Um, there are four ways that this can happen. First degree AV block, which is essentially just a prolonged PR interval. Second, and uh, MOBITS-1 and second MOBITS-2. Um, these, uh, again, I go into these in the bradyarrhythmias. I really don't want to... Uh, to hash this out too much. I want to keep this fairly cursory. And then uh, third degree block. Now, if it's symptomatic, again, treat it with atropine and then external pacing if that's not enough. However, with the MOBITS 2 and the third degree AV block, these patients will need uh, internal pacing. Now, contractile dysfunction is basically congestive heart failure secondary to an MI. Um, so some of the myocardium dies, the heart's ability to pump is reduced. Uh, usually this will be left ventricular dysfunction um, just because of the predominance of the left heart when you have an MI. Um, so blood will get backed up into the lungs in the pulmonary circulation resulting in pulmonary edema, rails, shortness of breath, dyspnea. Um, remember that we measure the left ventricular ejection fraction as a percentage um, when we do an echocardiogram. Right ventricular dysfunction would result in backup into the peripheral venous circulation. So look for venous stasis, hepatomegaly, and ascites. Diagnosis, echo. We do echoes all the time in patients who have had an MI, even uh, months post-MI, uh, to get an idea of their left ventricular ejection fraction because left ventricular ejection fraction is a really, really, really big uh, prognosticating factor for survival after a heart attack. Mechanical dysfunction uh, generally happens within days of an MI. So what I want to point out here, just very briefly, is that if you have a patient who suddenly dies within hours or a day, maybe, of an MI, it's probably due to an arrhythmia, like VFib. On the other hand, if they suddenly die within, you know, maybe three days, four days after an MI, Think of this one, free wall rupture. We'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail. These are often severe. Uh, usually there's a new murmur. Remember, anytime there's an issue with the heart's uh, structure, uh, so like a valve, for instance, or uh, the septum, you're going to get a murmur. Uh, so look for a, a sudden new murmur. Uh, look for sudden symptoms of congestive heart failure uh, up to cardiogenic shock. 
The best initial test is an echocardiogram. We're looking at the structure of the heart here, so that's certainly going to be more useful in the treatment of surgical correction. Okay, so papillary muscle uh, dysfunction or rupture is pretty much what it sounds like, but remember that this muscle uh, is responsible for contracting the mitral valve, uh, for opening and closing the mitral valve. Uh, so what we get here then is a sudden mitral regurgitation. And this is therefore going to cause a holosystolic murmur that's most prominent at the apex and left axilla, just like we would expect with any mitral regurgitation. The diagnosis here is echocardiogram, the treatment is surgical repair. So look for a patient because we have a mitral regurgitation, we're gonna have an increased pressure in the left uh, atrium. And so that's going to cause pulmonary uh, symptoms. Uh, ventricular septal rupture, pretty much presents identically to uh, papillary muscle rupture. The major difference is that on physical exam, the murmur will be more prominent along the left sternal border because we're talking about a rupture of the uh, ventricular septum here rather than the mitral valve. So it's just location. Free wall rupture is catastrophic. Uh, depending on how severe, the how large the rupture is, uh, you may be able to save these patients, but the vast majority of these patients die. What happens is that uh, blood will spill out from the heart into the pericardial space, cause a cardiac tamponade. These patients uh, go into shock and they die. The treatment, if you can get to them, is pericardiocentesis and emergent surgical repair. Ventricular pseudoaneurysm is a ballooning of the heart. Um, it usually occurs at the apex. These patients will have chest pain, CHF symptoms. They can even get embolic phenomenon. And the reason that that happens is that the uh, aneurysmal site, like any aneurysm, is not uh, conducting blood properly. That blood will then pool. And the consequence of that is that you develop a clot, which can then be uh, pumped out. And because this tends to happen at the left ventricle, uh, that will then go to the cerebral circulation. Diagnosis again here is echo and the treatment is surgical repair. Dressler syndrome is a pericarditis that occurs after an MI. What happens here is that uh, heart cells die, it exposes these neoantigens, antibodies are made and it attacks the pericardium causing pericarditis. The symptoms are pretty much identical to any pericarditis. Pleuritic chest pain, friction rub, low-grade fever. Uh, labs will show signs of inflammation, elevated sed rate, leukocytosis, but the giveaway here is on EKG, you'll see diffuse ST elevation, but normal enzymes. Remember uh, that ST elevation is scary. It could be a STEMI, but in STEMI, we will always see elevated cardiac enzymes. Diagnosis here is clinical. Um, pericarditis symptoms uh, in a post-MI patient is really the, the dead giveaway al along with the EKG. Treatment is NSAIDs or aspirin as well as colchicine. Um, I do want to point out also here, since I didn't, uh, pericarditis, the pain that you get with pericarditis is classically improved by sitting up and worsened by laying down. So look for that in the vignette as well. And this is that diffuse ST elevation, which you can see here and here and here and here and here. It's all over.